very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. John Campbell, a solid state physicist from Christchurch, New Zealand. Now, John is really no stranger to Athens, Georgia. He's been coming to Athens, uh, to the University of Georgia, to work with physics, physics professor Uwe Hapek since 1993. And during that time, he has run four firewalks for UGA students. Now, it just so happens that you could see a condensed version of a firewalk from our RSL um, video archive if you're interested. About a decade ago, John retired from the University of Canterbury, <laughs> but he's continued to communicate science to the general public through firewalks, uh, talks such as the one we're having tonight, and many publications for which he has won several awards. He is the biographer of Ernest Rutherford, the New Zealand educated physicist who became known as the father of nuclear physics. His three hour documentary on Rutherford is based on his book, Rutherford, Scientist Supreme, and received the Canadian Nuclear Society Education Award in 2012. John encourages both children and adults to wonder about science through his Ask the Scientist program um, that is published weekly throughout New Zealand newspapers. But tonight we are here to learn something about his adventures as an amateur archaeologist, marine archaeologist, which took him to France, Italy, Cyprus, Turkey, and the Chatham Islands over five decades, and lessons he learned from those experiences. Please welcome John Campbell. As a scientist, one stumbles into various uh, unusual fields, and this happened early in my life. In the mid-60s, I went to the University of London to do a research degree, and I joined the University of Sub the University of London Sub Aqua Club, and these were students, grad students, undergrads. There were marine zoologists, engineers. It was a fantastic group. They were absolute nutters. The water in England is cold, dirty, it's a long way from London, but they were just my type of person because cold water and dirty water produces good divers. <laughs> <laughs> Being students, you can imagine what happens when the first summer comes round. Right, where are we going for our summer holidays? Well, it's got to be somewhere warm, the French Mediterranean coast. What are we going to do to justify it? Well, we'll develop methods for surveying underwater. Our <coughs> contact was Frederick Dumas, who was Cousteau's diving master, and near where he lived there was a sunken port. And so we were going to survey that. So as a physical scientist, I designed and, and built a floodable telescope underwater. It was the old days when, when you were surveying an archaeological site, you had a plane table, and you had this telescope on it, and you could switch around and measure accurately what angle some object was off, and then shift. And through triangulation, you could build up a map of the area. And so that worked uh, quite satisfactory. Near the end of the survey, we came across a shipwreck. We got quite excited about this because this was a Roman port that had sunk uh, with the tectonics of the Mediterranean at the time. And then someone came up with a carriage fault. Damn, you know, that's the end of something being nicely old. <coughs> it turned out the ship wasn't old, but the Romans had carriage faults anyway. We never give enough credit for the ancients for what they knew and what they could do. And that's been one of my big lessons I learned through marine archaeology. Italy. 
The season after that was part of an expedition in working in Italy. Now, as Rome grew in power, they built roads, radiating. All roads lead to Rome. And as they went south, down towards Naples, two-thirds of the way down, there was a major obstacle, a river that was 10 metres deep and 50 metres wide. To uh, protect that crossing, they retired soldiers to the area, and then... Uh, and they could guard this crossing, which was a bit delicate otherwise. In the 1930s, the town that had grown up alongside this river uh, uh, had been excavated on land. Our job was to have a look along a river beside an ancient town to see what was there. Now, this river was only a kilometre from the sea, very deep river, so it was a major port in its day. One of the few places you could take a ship and land in, into protection. This is that river running in the right hand corner there. And we're about a kilometre from the sea. The Via Arpia, now, Certainly in those days, probably still now, you can still drive over the bricks that the Rome, or the stones the Romans built the Via Arpia from going down towards Naples. And their main highway is still called the Via Arpia. So the part that had been excavated on land included a, uh, an amphitheatre, um, and you can see parts of buildings here. This area had grown with Rome and decayed with Rome. And they'd shifted up the hills because the land had sort of subsided. It was a swamp, it was malaria, so it wasn't a healthy place to live. But from 400 um, BC to about 400 AD, it, it was a major area. You can see the, um, the main road coming through here. That was the old Via Arpia. And there was the crossing here, and that's why they built So along here, there were... Things associated with a port, all the dockyards and so on, ship launching bits and pieces. And we started down about here and first season started going along this bank looking to see what was there just on the surface to start mapping the place. <clears throat> just while I have the slide up here, if you don't this area here, that's an enormous cemetery from the Second World War. The Americans are on one side coming up towards Rome, the Germans defending here. There was a hell of a lot of stuff thrown at each other. Some of it ended up in the river. In one area, less than the state, there were 22 artillery shells. We couldn't go back for the second season until the uh, Italian Navy had cleared all these unexploded shells from there. Filthy looking river, just upstream was a nuclear power plant that used it as for cooling water. Uh, rural area would have to buoy occasionally if it found something decent underwater and you'd come down in the morning and attached to the buoy would have been caught up, you know, a dog with its, with its uh, legs tied up with wire or half a cow, some farmer had thrown in the river just as general rub. So all sorts of rubbish gets into a river. We were looking to see what was there from an ancient town. Because of the war, there was a lot of iron and steel in there, and so the bottom had concreted. The iron salts had, had uh, interacted with clay and formed almost a concrete. You could smash it with a hammer. And as they were really only looking at the surface, but this gives an indication of what was there beside an ancient town. Uh, if you look down here, shards of pottery. Over here, a little medical instrument for scraping things. This flat bit here is specular metal, very soft metal that could be polished, and the Romans used it as a mirror. Uh, 
a nail from construction, bronze nail from woodwork construction, uh, a bit of a bronze uh, decorative ornament worn by people, <coughs> lead, now this looks molten, it was probably fired out of a rifle during the Second World War, but there's a lot of lead around because the Romans used it to join together bits of statues uh, where you had to join on an arm or, or put on a head. They were locked in place with a key of, of lead. Uh, here is a bronze coin that was uh, uh, still in the concretion stage there. Right, so there's everything there that just sort of got washed into a river as one was from any town today. Uh, things get lost, they go into the drains, they get flushed out into the uh, drain outlets. In this case, it, it was the river. So there's all sorts of junk there. This is a few of the bits of gold, rings, uh, earrings, loops for earrings, just the same as ladies wear today, nothing new, various little pendants and so on. The writing implement of the day, for writing on wax tablet, uh, you would write with a sharp end, if you made a mistake you rubbed it out with a blunt end. And then this one is a uh, an ebony one again, sharp end and a less sharp end for rubbing out if needed. The Romans had all sorts of things we think of today as relatively modern inventions. They had the safety pins and this is the fibulas that were just uh, pinned up the toga that they, they wore as a general dress. On about the last day of the first year's expedition, we came across on the, on the edge of the water uh, some wooden piles. Now, this is all shingle out here, it covers whatever is below it. These were on the edge, that's why we're going along this edge because the Roman surface was still exposed. And that meant we now had something important to study. Uh, Cicero mentioned that the, the crossing eventually became a bridge. A bridge was built to replace the pontoon that was used to ferry people across. And so two things about that. One is we could study the construction techniques. <coughs> we found about 10,000 coins just surface collecting. And a, a numerous medicine from Oxford University studied these. And why so many? They weren't just, they were quite good coins, some of them. They weren't just uh, lost in the rubbish. Um, when the bridge was built, there would be a vote of offering to the gods. People would just toss a coin into the river, like they do in fountains today. And when times were good, they'd toss in a higher value coin than when times were bad, when they got the rubbish coins. And a study of that ensemble of coins just showed that this area did grow with Rome and die with Rome. Oh yeah. <clears throat> now it's a country where not everyone is honest. In my last trip back there about uh, 10 years ago we were just photographing some of the finds and I decided to have one last dive. And I went down to the river bank and I'm standing on the bank here at the, and I'm just going to step off. So I'm under trees, it's still rural on that little bit there. And I was about to hop in with my diving gear on and there's this blue who's obviously a diver down there, burgling the place. Uh, I swam across, I went across the other side of the river, swam underwater, tapped him on the shoulder. And you can't speak underwater, or, you know, and he turned around. You must have had a laundry problem for me tapping him on the shoulder. But I went, you know, saying, you can't do that. Well, he must have thought it was my place and he shifted a couple of metres and carried on. The bottom had been taken down about this far by these burgers. There is just so much Roman material in Italy, they don't really have any great uh, protection on the things, which is a great shame because this stuff gets pinched and it goes out of context. Everything we did is carefully mapped where they came from and we could start getting a larger picture from it. Uh, in the 
first season, it was rumoured that the local school teacher was running a mistress on the proceeds of the stuff he was thieving from the river. So that was along there. Here's the, the Via Arpia bisecting the, the main Roman site, and so it would cross about here, right where we had the piles. So with the piles, you have to drive these things in to the bottom. And so it's just like pile driving today. At the base of any pile, there's a steel shoe. Now, the piles you can get from trees just around the river. But steel, you've got to transport it long distances from wherever the steel manufacturing site is. And so I took one of these to our mechanical engineers, the metallurgist, to find out how these were manufactured. But just four flat, flat pieces of steel, hammer shaped, a hammer welded down here. Each arm has two holes in it with a bronze nail through, hammered into the pile to keep it in place while it's being driven. And then you just thump the thing down into the, into the uh, river bottle. But with the piles themselves, we're onto something more important because these were oak trees from around this site. Uh, the piles could be, you know, a small tree about this diameter, and some of them were a quarter of a tree, and they could be, you know, up to this size, enormous things. And that means we've got tree ring analysis. These piles, as one rotted, another one would be driven in. It was the bits that went into the mud that really survived. They didn't have oxygen there. The wood inside those were as good as the day it was driven in. And I have a, from, a, from an excess bit of wood, I have a uh, little wee liqueur glass made of this Roman wood, which uh, goes back much further than the liquor that goes into it. So, be able to get a tree ring analysis, this would cover this 400 year period of very important time in the Roman history, and it would allow one to take any other bit of wood you could actually date it from this tree ring series. So we needed lots of sections across these. And our first section, and in our first summer, we just had a bow saw, you know, the metal frame and a saw across, and you're underwater and go, and you get almost no wood. And some of this wood had been almost petrified. It was uh, quite hard. The second year, a lot to hell with this, and I got the expedition to purchase a two-man cross-cut saw. Well, that wasn't all that good. It was much more effective than the cross-cut. But you couldn't see out of your mask hardly underwater in this filthy river. And you couldn't see the fellow on the other end of the saw, so it was always hard keeping them in uh, uh, sync with each other. And so the third thing is, oh, damn it. So I went and purchased a, a chainsaw and it was the days where, going from New Zealand to Rome by air, I just carried this chainsaw on as hand luggage and just <laughs> popped it in the overhead rail. <laughs> Imagine trying to do that today with a slightly demented look on your face. <laughs> and it was only the connoisseur that would appreciate that that chainsaw was driven by compressed air and it couldn't actually be got going on board an aircraft. Um, but that sure made it a lot easier. But you can see the, the scale of some of these. Uh, this had been, from there down, was perfectly good wood stored in the mud in the river bottom with the concretion over the top. Just these little bits sticking up above the concretion to uh, make it obvious that there is a bridge there, or was a bridge there, and they were quite close together because there's one rotted, another was driven in. And so we got a tree ring analysis from that, and that allowed any wood in that area to be dated. It wasn't great because these trees had grown on the river flats. They, they had no hard life any one year. It was just good growing all the time, and so the tree rings are all much the same. What you really need is a period of drought where there's almost, where there's a very narrow tree ring, and that will stand out in any piece of wood. 
I've got one more on the chainsaw, <coughs> showing it underwater. Now this is carefully posed, the chainsaw is not working when it was working, I mean this shows how dirty the river was, but when the chainsaw was working you couldn't see out of your mask because of the mud and the and the sawdust that was being thrown up and the, and the bits of junk around the place. So every now and again you would have to uh, stop it and count your number of legs to see you hadn't lost anything. Right, <coughs> the other hemisphere, 500 miles off of New Zealand, there's some islands, the Chatham Islands. There's about 500 people live there. And I had three summers there doing a survey of the shipwrecks for the New Zealand Historic Places Trust. There's a little bit of land sticking up in the middle of nowhere, it just had ships running into it, several hundred of them over historical times. So the challenge, yes, there is a prevailing wind, as this tree on the edge of the cliff shows. <coughs> But even back then, the Chatham Islands had all the facilities of modern life that New Zealand had. Now, I talked to a group last night, and they were all young students, and none of them can remember what I hope a few of you can remember. If, remember the days when the milkman delivered milk to your gate in glass bottles, right? Even back then, Chatham Islands had the same facilities in New Zealand. The milk was delivered to the gate in glass bottles. <laughs> the milkman had a uh, night job as barman at the pub. And with these islands being so far away, you know, you didn't waste <laughs> any products. <laughs> Off Chatham Island is a smaller one called Pit. 50 people live there, all involved with fishing or with farming. There were three wrecks off that little island. One of them, I didn't know where it was. It had never been located accurately. And it was an American whaler. And so I was quite keen to find out exactly where this is and go and look and see what was left there. And so I talked to the locals. And they said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, old Dutchy, he lives over there. Yeah, talk to the Dutchman, he'll know. When I finally got to the Dutchman, he was a 60-year-old, fifth-generation Maori New Zealander. He got his nickname from when he was in the school, uh, the one teacher's school on the island. They had a play, and he played the part of the Dutchman, <laughs> and that stuck. So that was another lesson, take nothing for granted. <laughs> it was a waste of time when looking around the island for someone with, uh, you know, blonde, Dutch, Dutchman with blonde hair. This wreck was reputed to be in this bay, quite a high cliff down to it. The safety in those days was I drove the Land Rover to where I wanted to die, parked at the top of the cliff, and the safety side was if I wasn't back by dark, eventually they'd come and find the Land Rover somewhere and they knew my body would be somewhere around there. And so I got to the top of this cliff, looked down, and here's these ripples coming into the shore down below. And so I carried the dive gear on my back down this cliff. It was, you know, fingers and toes sort of thing. And that means, you know, a heavy steel cylinder, a lead weight belt around here, and a bag of diving gear across my shoulders. But I got down there and realised that these ripples were half a metre high waves crashing on a rocky foreshore. I could get out through them, but there's no way I would risk coming back ashore the same way. And so safety did take over. And I climbed up this cliff carrying the gear. It would kill me if I tried it today. And remember the days before selfies? We actually did have selfies. You had a camera and you plonk it down somewhere with a 10 second delay and then you scramble to get into position and carefully pose for the photo. Well, that's why selfie coming up <laughs> from that cliff. <coughs> so, being safety conscious, I went back to the, the uh, little harbour, which is a long way from here, saw a fisherman and got a lift with a fisherman who was going round his cray pots. And he dropped me behind the breakers and I spent two hours 
searching fruitlessly for any sign of the ship. It was all just dumped, jumbled rock. Well, he vanished over the horizon um, to check his cray pots. And I'm rather glad he never sunk that day because it was an awfully long swim to get back to port. And a friend in the Maritime Museum in Australia in Perth who was um, examining all known shipwrecks, the rudder on a ship is mounted on these pintles. And these are actually uh, upside down. These pins point downwards. The weight of the rudder keeps these down. And on the stern of the ship is a gudgeon that has a hole in it. The pin fits through it. Uh, and so he was studying from known shipwrecks what size the pintles were and gudgeons. And then hopefully if you've got an unknown ship, you would know roughly what size it was just from these artefacts. These were made in marine bronze. They were about the last thing to survive any wreck when everything else had dissolved away or rotted away. There was a problem. This was from a ship called the Elizabeth. And I came across these and I couldn't make sense of the layout of the ship. You know, you had anchors in the bow and, and you expect these down the stern and they were nowhere near the stern. I talked to some local divers, crayfish dive. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we came across those. And we tried to get them ashore, but they're too heavy, so we dropped them. Right, so now they're out of context. And that's why people shouldn't interfere with any wreck <coughs> site or any archaeological site and take things out of, so things end up out of context. And so I was quite conscious of these things because divers would find them, and if they didn't, take them ashore and sell them for scrap and get lost. They would use them in deep sea crayfish pots as weights and they'd be lost way out to sea, out of, con out of context again, but lost forever because they'd, they'd never find this rusted old uh, crayfish pot. In one of the little harbours, there was a wreck known to have gone down there. It was the little local sailing vessel that traded between the Chathams and New Zealand, and it sunk at its moorings. Quite likely it was an insurance job, as several were over there, where there's not too much in the way of authority to check up on these things. Um, so I went looking for this, and I found the wreck site in the middle of this harbour. It was just through a little dross from fishing boats thrown over bits and pieces of junk. Um, and I had no way of, uh, I was, wasn't collecting artefacts because I had no way of conserving anything. All I was doing was recording position and information about these wrecks. But here was a rudder with two pindles on it. Um, just to give the scales in. And I agonised over this overnight and I thought, if it's left there, a diver's going to find it, they're going to use those pintles just as weights and it's going to get lost. So I thought, right, well, I'll definitely have to go back and get it. I could leave the, the wooden part you see is very badly damaged. And I could leave that in the peat creek for a year till I was next there, hoping that the wax coming out of the peat would stabilise some of the wood structure. So the next morning we went back to lift this. Everyone seen the, the uh, film Jaws? Right? Well, with his cousin, Gums, there on the beach was a large white pointer that had been caught in a net in that harbour overnight. And on the challenge, they sort of breed and they go around in pairs. Uh, and the thought of a disgruntled pair still being around, I tell you, it was the fastest dive I've had in my life to drop down and put the rope around that rudder and get back up into the dinghy and then tow it ashore. I then went and saw the fisherman who had uh, cut out all the teeth from the white pointer and I gave him a crate of beer for five teeth and now I've got a family heirloom and the female member of the family. <coughs> With Pitt Island, I mentioned about that, um, uh, the Dutchman, but Pitt Island had a population of 50 
they had a one teacher school and every now and again or a year they'd take the pupils out to New Zealand to see a big city and it was my city Christchurch where the uh, boat used to go from and the aeroplane went to and so preparing the kids for this visit to the big smoke the teacher was showing slides of colour slides of, of Christchurch and one of these was taken at night from the hills above Christchurch looking down and just spread out as a ray of a large city with all the lights from the houses and the streets and everything. And one of the kids said, gee, that must be a noisy place. Can anyone figure out why? On the challenge, they didn't have an electricity grid. Each house had a diesel generator and a back shed that throbbed away at night to get their television working and, and cool down the fridge for the rest of the day. Right, back to the other side of the world. Um, fairly recently, you might have seen mention of an artefact from a famous wreck off the Antikythera Islands in Greece. It was 1900. Oh, sorry, that recent reference was that one of the bits of stuff they recovered was just a bit of concretion. When they x-rayed it, they realised it was made up with gears and it was a very early navigation instrument that no one had any idea they had or knew anything about. Uh, the Antikythera mechanism. Right. This wreck was discovered by uh, Greek sponge divers. They'd been working off the African coast in 1900. They'd really plundered the their side of the Mediterranean, and now they were down in the, the other parts. And they were sailing back to Greece, and they were sheltering in the Antikythera Island. And while they were waiting for the storm to subside, to allow them to carry on, they, of course, went down to see if they could get any sponges. And these are hard hat divers in this sort of gear. Very heavy boots, very heavy weight on the chest. You can actually walk on the bottom and actually do work like swing a sledgehammer if need be. But that was the standard diving suit of the 1900s. And the sponge guy was walking across this flat bottom, a bit of marine growth here and there, and he came across a bronze hand sticking out of the mud. And they grabbed that and a few other things, went to the authorities back in, in Greece, an expedition was mounted uh, using these sponge divers. It was rather deep and it's dangerous. They ended up killing one diver and bending at least one other from nitrogen um, uh, bubbles coming out into bubbles in the blood and then getting to the wrong part of the body. Either it crippled them if it was in a joint somewhere or if it got to the brain it killed them. And that was the end. But they managed to get some fantastic stuff, uh, which is in the Athens Museum, National Museum today. There was the philosopher's head and the, uh, uh, the Antikythera boy, very famous bronze statuary and all sorts of other bits and pieces. And it turned out 1900 until, you know, about five years ago, they didn't realise they had this great mechanism that was just uh, in a very bad way that only x-rays and then careful study. Got them onto it. Now, so here's this wreck that from 1901 when they killed the divers uh, had never been visited again. The fellow who organised our expeditions uh, had a grand title of the President of the Nautical Archaeological Institute or something or other. He was actually a real estate agent in California and he really had a passion for ancient jewellery and I do suspect the old thing about, about him being involved in all this. Uh, I remember his enthusiasm when we were in our first season. I came across a gold necklace, and uh, it was about, about this long, and it was broken, so who knows how long it really was. And the interest he showed in that made me think this fellow really isn't. Archaeology and knowledge really isn't at the forefront. But our second season, he was going to take us, we're going to go off to the Antikythera Islands. 
deep, dangerous work. It was just the early days where you could get over nitrogen narcosis by using mixed gases, exchanging the nitrogen for helium gas. And so to do that, it was the very early days of deep sea oil rig diving, and the techniques were just starting to come in. So I did a week's course with the manufacturers of this gear in London, C.B. Gorman's, and you get a great fund of stories you can tell physics students who <clears throat> are more squeamish than others because they're not really used to cutting up rats and all this sort of stuff in the labs. But in this suit, you have air pumped down through an air hose, and this suit is sort of blown up a bit, um, and you breathe quite happily inside the suit. But if the air hose ruptures uh, closer than the long return valve, the air is just going to flow out. <clears throat> Normally air is pumped into that suit just at a higher pressure than the depth of water you're at. But if that air hose breaks and the air can escape, or if a window broke and that, uh, the standard thing was that the pressure would just strip the flesh off the diver and he'd end up inside the helmet. So I love telling the physics students I used to be pretty off. And then just after I'd done this course, luckily the organiser died, because otherwise me and others would have too, I reckon, diving in deep water in the very early days of this mixed gases. Kyrenia, beautiful little port in Cyprus. One of my mates I started with marine archaeology, he went, he was in it full time his whole working life. And they were there, I visited him in 1974. Two weeks later, Turkey invaded Cyprus through this port. It must have been something I said, I don't know. But just off this port, There was a tired old freighter, about 80 years old, and a storm must have overtaken it, and it sank. It was a first century BC ship, and so the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, they had a main thrust of looking at the technologies of the day. They, had, they used to go around talking to sponge divers, find out where wrecks were, roughly date them, and they were excavating one every about five years and looking at shipbuilding techniques over time. And so they spent five years excavating this ship. It takes about five years. You have to do it very carefully, work your way down. Then once you're down to the bottom of the hull, um, everything's plotted in position before it comes up. It comes up for conservation, that can take a couple of years. The timbers have to be put in polyethylene glycol for a couple of years to put wax into the, uh, the water-filled cells, because otherwise the weight of it will just collapse when it comes on land. Once all that was done, the hull was reassembled, and so people could see what it looked like. Now it turns out the ship it was a bit short of cargo, and there were a couple of other indicators that it probably wasn't a storm, but it was probably taken by pirates and, and sunk. In order for people to uh, see how the thing was built, here you've got the ancient artisan, hammer hard hardening copper nails, just hitting them with a hammer and putting a lot of defects into it so the copper went from its normal soft state to hard state for the nails to hold this together. Now the construction of these ships and most of the others they studied were the planks first were all joined together and the ribs were put on afterwards. If you concentrate on the join between two planks here, 
They're butted together. How do you hold them there? Well, you chisel a groove out of top and bottom planks, put in a rectangle of wood, and then you drill a hole through the lot and put in a wooden dowel uh, that's just the, exactly the right size. What well, have it can be a little bit bigger. Now, when wood gets wet, it swells, and that'll keep the joint good. And then the ribs go on, so holes are drilled through the plank and through the rib. The big nail is hammered in. Uh, there's a wooden tr trundle there that just gets spread out and really blocks the hole and stops any minor leaks. The copper nail is driven through. The leftover bit of the trundle is just broken off. The end, end of this is bent at right angles. And then it's bent over so that the point at the end digs in, and that stops the thing being able to move. You can actually see how the people made these things quite nicely. And you're thinking, by gee, they did that on the cheek, all this crummy wood. That is typical of the wood that that ship was built from. The other end of the world, New Zealand. It was the last place to be worried by humans. It was only 700 years ago that Polynesians discovered it. And to start with, they had good living. They ate the mower and, and uh, these are big birds like um, ostriches and so on. They ate them out of existence. Population pressures became a bit high. They had to do a lot of gardening and have a bit of warfare just to take over the others when the crops were right. But up till then they had quite good living. This is a place up in the North Island where there are a lot of gardens on the slopes here. And that was being studied by Auckland University. And nearby was this lake, Lake Ovariki. Now around the lake on the flats, there were signs of habitation just on the surface. Now the standard one, the Maori were the last really of the, it was a Stone Age society, and they never caught up with the outside world until the Europeans discovered New Zealand uh, about 400 years ago. The sign of a hut was the stones laid out in this rectangular fashion for the fireplace. And this showed where huts were. They could look at uh, settlement patterns and, and what went on in the huts. But it was noticed that these things um, had been trampled by cattle. And so the surface was really messed up. And some of these were down right at the lake's edge, and some even slightly underwater in the lake. And the thought was that underwater there might be ones that haven't been trampled by cattle from European times. And so the idea was to have a look in that lake to see what we could find. The first job was to cut a track from the edge of the lake beyond the, the reeds, through the reeds and so on, so we could actually get out into it. The, uh, I had two other friends who were the divers, the laborers on the job, and I showed management skill in this. I left them doing the dirty, rotten work around the edge of the lake, cutting away the weed, trying to look for any fireplaces, while I skived off to have a quick dive right through the whole lake for uh, you know, what else is it? anything else stand there? And right in the deepest part of the lake, which was 15 metres, if I remember right, um, here was wood worked by man. Uh, looking great, just the way it had been when it was manufactured. Great. There was only one problem. This is it. It was a European post and rail fence in the deepest part of this lake. So that put the kiwash on the whole thing. <clears throat> and why was that? So they go and talk to the locals. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. During the war, oh, this has apparently been quite a small little lake. Uh, it was drained through an underground passage to a little stream that came out further down. It was a great ailing resource for the Maori. And 
during the war, some of the lads thought, well, they could improve on this, and they would use a ministry works minnow. Now, that's half a stick of dynamite that you toss into the water. And, and they obviously tossed it too close to the south and blocked it, and so the lake rose. <laughs> so, <clears throat> that's the sort of thing that goes on you don't really hear about. And so we're now just reduced to mapping the whole area and position of fences and so on. But there was no great interest in the prehistoric period of the Maori epoch. Back to the coast of Turkey. The oldest known shipwreck is a, is a, at that time was in a place called Ulubog. There's a letter from one king to another saying, I'm sending you these presents. And everything in that letter is on that wreck site, except for about three objects that are water soluble, lapis lazuli and so on. When I was visiting, they were proofreading this article on the National Geographic. A carefully posed photograph, of course, um, you can see underground lights and no excavation sort of looks like this. These were put back in there just to give them a nice picking because the real excavation was like the previous one you saw where everything's taken down and then removed for conservation. But this site had uh, copper ingots in the shape of an ox hide and this allowed a man front and back, two people to carry this. Um, there were ingots of zinc because to make bronze, bronze age, you need zinc and copper. There were amphora filled with all sorts of things, all bits and pieces connected with ships. Um, and that ingot there, if I remember right, was glass ingot, so it could be melted and turned into glass whenever it got to uh, a glass blower, one of the exports of the time. Most ship, ships and sailors were poor freighters. Uh, they were just were common working men. This was unusual. In the, in the galley area were two bronze goblets. By the time I got there, these had been conserved, polished up. They were in a vault in the um, museum, and I've had those in my hand. Again, one of the little perks in life when they showed it to me. This is the cliff face outside. It's a long way to, from a little port called Cass, a real nice looking place. And this cliff face, this is where the ship ran into it, um, slid down and it quickly drops away here and it's down at quite deep, deep water. The encampment again takes about five years to excavate a ship. The research vessel was just off this picture moored above it. Uh, on this platform is the divers' equipment and uh, tanks and where they are all filled, all the wet storage. They can step down here and into the water and get to work straight away. Above it, the conservation lab, where all the objects that came up were conserved. Up there is the electric power supply for the whole camp and the uh, compressors for the compressed air. These have to be removed, oh, and this is the mess hall and then where people slept. Um, and all this had to be removed at the end of each season because the winter storms would have just washed them away. So the site wasn't contaminated, nothing went into the water. The Turkish boatman came out each day with a big tank of water that was pumped in for the supplies and he took away every bit of rubbish from the site, including the used toilet paper. And if you look at this little hut a long way from the rest of the camp on this platform, it overhangs the water and there's a square hole in it there. The only thing that wasn't taken away from the site was what had just left your body before it splashed. And you could look down there and see that and you could also see the fish growing fat on it. The Turkish assistant, a cook's assistant, had a nice little learner going. 
he would catch these fish through this hole and late in the day all the tourist ships the ships taking tourists for tours around the islands and so on would be heading back to Cass they would call in here by the fish off this cook's assistant take it back into port and that night the tourists would pay money to eat those fish I just thought I'd mention that in case anyone's going for an overseas trip this summer um, and that's probably the most recent lesson to it in the marine archaeology. Right, done. We have time for a few questions. If anybody has any questions. When did you usually okay. go and do this sort of thing? So again? When did you usually go and do this sort of thing? When did I usually do it? Yeah, summer vacation or what? Ah uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I was an academic, yeah. and so it was either summer vacation or when I was on on leave overseas, I could sleep away for a month because I was a, I could describe myself as a physical scientist on the expedition. So, um, where's where did your physics knowledge come into this, or or did it have? Uh, well, you can see how it started through just designing a floodable telescope and building that. Yeah. Um, but it was just also general knowledge, like one time the uh, one of the motors packed up, we had to take it apart. They had to go up the hills to see so-and-so. Turns out, I'm sure he was a mafia boss. <laughs> and then, but, we, you know, you managed to get him working. But no, it, it was... I haven't covered a lot of the physics. That, through this, I got interested in archaeometry, which is applying science to archaeology and the history of art. And uh, so there are things like from my physics, I spent a little time at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts on one leave, and they had a Renoir painting that was being examined. A, a lady, they have a very famous Renoir painting, the dance, and a lady had brought in a smaller version of this and wanted to know about it. And so they x-ray in it and doing x-ray for reasons to identify what paints there were on it. Uh, I was a solid state physicist and that was about the electrical properties of single crystals which includes quartz. Now quartz isn't everything, clays and bricks and, and quartz, uh, if you have a, an alpha particle, radioactive particle hits this thing, it just rips electrons off atoms. It causes a lot of damage. You can't really see it, but then if you start dissolving it away, you will see um, an edge pit. Well, the other way is all you do is take that quartz and heat it up. And when it gets to about 70 degrees, some of these trapped electrons will jump back to where they should be, and they will emit their energy as a flash of light. And so you can measure the amount of light that's come out from this and after you've heated the quartz now all the damage has been fixed up and it's back to pure original quartz as though it was just manufacturing and so now each radiation coming in will cause more damage and so you make a measurement of the the light emitted from that quartz as you heat it up you then irradiate the same sample with a known dose of radiation, and you can tell when this was last heated. So from that technique, you can date when a piece of pottery was last heated. Oh, when it was manufactured. The real thing is you can only date when it was last heated, because it might have been manufactured a couple of thousand years ago, and then been in the house fire, and that would be enough to, to uh, annihilate out all the damage. What was your, your own personal favorite find on, on any of this archaeological dives? The thin veneer of the marine archaeologists about that there for the information gets rather thin. And I guess it was the gold necklace I brought up. <laughs> you know, it always comes back to that. And even Robin, when he discovered those two goblets, he sort of 
I saw it burst out of the water. Here's gold! Yeah. But they were all their life getting the information on how ships were built and, and all the information one could get from this. And that's why you, you've got to be careful having these treasure hunters. They only want the stuff and they're not concerned with the information. And that destroys knowledge of the past. Great shame. You seem pretty excited about those goblets, so I just wondered if that was just to be able to touch. No, no, no. They were such an unusual find on a ship yeah, yeah. to have a gold object. Yeah. The Anticulderon was thought to have been the spoil from Sula's conquest, and we had taken it back to Rome for a, a, a procession by Julius Caesar to show what he had scored, and the ship sank. And that's why it was thought to have such great things on it. Are there no more questions?